بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على سید الشف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا محمد وعلى آلہ وآصحابہ اجمعین اما بعد فعوض باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم We concluded last week's tafsir by looking at the two qualities of this ummah, the ummah of Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The first quality of this ummah is that we are all wasat. Wasat means that we are all moderate in our beliefs and we should always be moderate in our actions and in our practices. And a good example can be found in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari that once a Sahabi in the name of Abdullah bin Umar al-Anhu is narrated that he would always worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would never leave any time for his wife. So now when the wife's father found out that Abdullah bin Umar al-Anu who is always worshipping and is not spending any time with the family. So the father went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he complained. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam found out, he then got angry on Abdullah bin Umar al-Anu and he then said to Hazrat Umar al-Anu, uh, Ibn Umar al-Anu that look, I also fast and there are days when I don't fast. Similarly, during the night, there are periods when I'm praying and there are periods when I'm not praying. Similarly, during the night, I go to sleep and there are times when I'm not going to sleep. And then Rasulullah said to Abdullah bin Umar al-Anhu that your body has a right, your wife has a right, your children have a right as well. So what we can gather from this particular hadith is that Islam doesn't say just worship 24-7 and then forget about your family, your wives, their hukuks, their needs and so on. But Islam actually says that you should worship Allah, you should spend time with your family and that's what wasat means, that moderation in practices, in a'mals and so on. So that was one of the qualities, one of the characteristics of this ummah is that our ummah in terms of beliefs in terms of practices we should always be moderate and then in last week's lesson i also mentioned another distinct feature of this particular ummah is that our testimony and our shahadat would be accepted in the hereafter and with regards to that there is a very famous hadith which can be found in sahih al-bukhari and in sunan al-tirmizi in sunan al-nasai that there was once a plague in madina munawwara this is obviously after Rasulullah passed away during the Khilafat of Hazrat Umar al-Anhu. And many, many janazas, many, many people passed away and their janazah was taking place. So there was once a particular janazah who passed by a group of people. And some of the people said that such and such a person is a good person. I.e. the janazah which passed away, the dead body. So some of the Sahabas were commenting that such a person is a very good person. So Hazrat Umar al-Anhu replied by saying wajabat. Then another janazah went past the group of Sahabas and the Sahabas this time were criticizing this particular janazah and the mayyit or the deceased. So again Hazrat Umar al-Anhu said wajabat. So one of the Sahabas asked Hazrat Umar al-Anhu that what do you mean by wajabat? that we praised one of the deceased you said wajabat wajabat means that yes sabit ho gaya that this is now going to happen and we then criticized another deceased and you then said wajabat then Hazrat umar al-anhu replied by saying that i heard rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that if a muslim testifies or if four muslims sorry four people were to testify good for a deceased then jannat would become wajib on that deceased the similarly the other way around that if four people were to testify bad things about this deceased then jahannam would be wajib on that particular person 
So what we can gather is that whenever somebody passes away, what we should do is that we should always think of the good of that person. Never think of the faults. Normally what happens is whenever somebody passes, we look for his fault. Oh, he was like this, he was like that. Halakha, what this particular hadith is telling us is that whenever somebody passes away, we should always try to praise them. And it could be because of our praising, even though we know this person wasn't a good person, but it could be that because of him, us praising him, because of us reminding or remembering the good things which this person had done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant him Jannah and Paradise. So these were the two characteristics of this particular Ummah, is that we are moderate and number two, our Shahadat and our Gawahi is accepted. Now the next part of the verse, verse 143 of Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he explains that why he gave the order of the Qibla being changed from Baytul Maqdis to the Baytullah. And it's mentioned in the Ayat al karima that Allah has said that إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِئُ الرَّسُولِ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ أَقِبَيْهِ So that we can know and acknowledge who would follow the Prophet and the Messenger Muhammad Mustafa وسلم, from those who would turn on their heels. Now what this ayat al is telling us is that the reason why Rasulullah وسلم, or Allah gave the order that let's change the Qibla from Baytul Maqdis to the Baytullah is to determine and derive who are true in their Iman and their beliefs and those who are false and munafik in their beliefs. And there are many many examples of that when we read the Holy Quran, when we study the Holy Quran, we'll find many examples where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave certain orders where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave certain commands to differentiate between the true believers and the munafiks. A good example of that can be of the Battle of Tabuk. Battle of Tabuk which was one of the very last battles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it happened in 9th Hijri. Now this battle took place during the summer when it was really really hot. And Tabuk is a place which is near Syria over 200 miles away from Medina Munawwara. And on top of that, it was during the summertime when the harvest and the fruits were being ripe and it was ready to be cut. So Rasulullah in those trying and testing situations and moments, he gave the order that everybody now has to go to Tabuk for a battle. Now, when this order came, many of the Sahabas did go but there were few people, few in particular Munafiks and so on, who didn't go. And they were thinking, no, no, it's too hot, we can't go to, for this battle. They came to Rasulullah they made all these excuses that, oh, it's too hot, you know, we've got this problem, we've got that problem, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why Wasallam and Allah gave this order to go and wage war against the people of Tabuk during the hot, scorching summers of Arabia is to determine who are true when they say Amanna Saddaqna and those who are false when they are saying Amanna Saddaqna. So exactly here as well that Rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gave this order of changing the Qibla. It's not something big changing the Qibla. Just imagine somebody was to come and say, you know, let's not pray towards Baytullah, let's go somewhere else. A very, very big order. So this was given to determine who are true believers and who are false believers. And it's mentioned in the Tafasids and in the commentaries that when this order was given, you know, there were some people who actually did become murtad. They actually did leave the fold of Islam. Why? Because they started questioning the religion that uh, how can this be true that one time we are praying salah to that direction. Now another time we are praying salah to another direction. So it was very, very difficult for some. So what happened was that they then left the religion. They became murtad. They started doing shirk and committing kufr like they were doing before. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, look, this order which I've given, there's a wisdom and hikmah behind it. The main wisdom and hikmah is to determine those who are true believers and those who are false believers. And this is what is then highlighted in the next ayat al karima where Allah says, وَإِن كَانَتْ لَكَ بِيْرَةً إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ That this order of changing the Qibla would, is a burden, like a is something big, Except for those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had guided. Illa ala Now what we mean by that, as I just explained, 
that this order which Allah had given would be very, very heavy. Body in terms of sakil, in terms of very difficult for people to act upon. However, those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had guided, like the sahabas, like the close companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, so for them to act upon this was very simple. Now, why was it very simple for them to act upon? Is because... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had gave the order. This is what I touched on before, ittibai sunnah, following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that we now have to change the qibla from Masjid al-Aqsa to the Baytullah, so all the sahabas, they acted upon it. So those sahabas, because obviously they were very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they had the suhbah and the barakah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So whenever Abu sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave this order, straight away, without any ifs or buts, then what happened? They turned the direction towards the Baytullah. Whereas you had other people who weren't that strong on their Iman and on their faith. This particular ruling and order from Allah to change the Qibla was something which is very, very, was very difficult for them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to say, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let your namaz go to waste. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَوُفُ rahim. It is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very kind and merciful on the people. Now the word here, the Arabic word is the word Iman. But we translate Iman here as Namaz, Salah. And the reason why we do it is because this ayat karima here was revealed when some Sahabas, they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that, O oh, Prophet of Allah, the Sabiqun al Awwalun, i.e., the Sahabas who had come to Medina Munawwara first and they were praying Salah to Masjid al Aqsa and now they've passed away and they didn't have the opportunity to pray Salah to the Baytullah. So, what would happen to their Namaz? You know, what would happen? Because obviously, if the Qibla had changed, so that would then mean naturally that the Namazis they prayed towards Masjid al Aqsa that should not be accepted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then clarifies this particular ishqal or waham which some of the sahabas had by saying, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُذِيَ إِيمَانَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never make your namaz go to waste. In other words, any kind of deeds you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always accept it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, نَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ He's never ever gonna waste our deeds. What we are doing, the problem is that we are wasting in terms of we're not praying our namazis properly, we're not utilizing our time properly. But as long as we do everything correctly, with ikhlas and with sincerity, Allah will definitely accept it. Okay, that, that is the main thing. Even I mentioned before about duas. You know, as long as we do the dua properly, efficiently, with the intention of only asking Allah and not just doing it for the, the rusum and for the practice, or for the custom, Allah will accept the dua. Now sometimes the duas may not be accepted straight away. Take an example of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, that when he prayed to Allah for the destruction of Fir'aun, it's mentioned that 40 years after that dua, that's when Allah accepted the dua, and that's when Fir'aun got destroyed. He didn't get destroyed straight away. Even many of the stories we read in the Quran about the prophets praying for the destruction on the people it wasn't straight away the duas were accepted it was after many many periods or months even years when Allah accepted the dua and the destruction and the azab and the punishment came so as long as we pray to Allah and we have sincerity in our deeds and actions Allah will accept it and the same here as well that if we pray namaz and we pray properly and correctly obviously at that time uh, Masjid Aqsa was the true Qibla for the Muslims and for the Sahabas so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising that their deeds and their actions will not go to waste. The next verse, verse 144, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues with the theme of the Qibla and he uses the words قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْشِكَ فِي السَّمَا That we have seen you, so we is referring to Allah here, that we have seen you, ay Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, تَقَلُّبَ وَجْشِكَ فِي السَّمَا your constant turning of the face fissama to the heavens. Now, what this particular ayat is telling us is that 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when the 16 months, when the 17 months passed after he migrated to Medina Munawwara, as I explained last week, that the order which was given to have the Qibla towards the Baytullah, sorry, uh, towards Masjid Aqsa, was to bring the Jews closer towards Islam. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam realized that basically this this wasn't working. We need to now probably revert to a another technique to bring the Jews and the Christians closer towards Islam. So Rasulullah kept on looking to the sky, kept on looking to the heavens. Why? Why did he keep on doing that? Is because he was hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, or Sayyidina Jibreel his salam will descend down with an order from Allah of the changing and the, uh, the on the changing and the of the Qibla and the direction of the Salah. It's like, say, say for example, like, you know, if someone, uh, like your parent when you're a toddler or when you're small and when you're walking with your parents or your mother or your father, you're always looking up to them, making sure they're nearby. So similar Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was always looking up to the heavens, waiting for a message from Allah, waiting for a message from Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam to come and to convey the message to change the uh, orientation of the Qibla. <coughs> so this is what is said here that indeed we have seen you turning your face with Sama to the heavens. Then Allah says <laughs> that we will certainly assign a Qibla tardaha which you like. So Allah is then saying that don't worry <coughs> soon because uh, is actually a word which is gives you a future tense meaning. So Allah is saying that don't worry a time, I'll bring the order, I'll bring the hukum, I'll tell Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam to come with the wahi to change the orientation of the Qibla. And then from the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Fawalli wajhaka shatr al masjid al haram. That now turn your face towards masjid al haram. So it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slowly, slowly preparing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Telling Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that yes, very soon the order will come of the changing of the qibla and the orientation, and thereafter Allah subhanahu wa taala then brings the order for wali wachaka shatra masjid al haram that turn your face towards the direction of masjid al haram, and then the next part of the verse Allah says wa haythu ma kuntum fawallu wuchu wa kum shatra that wherever you are, then face fawallu wuchu wa kum shatra. The face towards the Baytullah. So what this particular ayat is telling us that wherever we are in the world, whether we are in Makkah, then we should be facing towards the Aine Qibla, the exact direction of the Qibla. But when we are outside the city of Makkah, in Medina Munawwara or in other cities in the world, then Allah uses the word Shatra here. Now Shatra here means there doesn't have to be exact pinpoint facing towards the Baytullah. But as we explained, you have what we call a 45 degree leeway either side. So as long as you're not, you know, as long as you're within the 45 degree uh, perimeter, then your namaz will still be valid. So if you're not, just imagine if this was the Baytullah. So if you from Birmingham, you can't get it pinpoint towards Baytullah, but up to 45 degrees you're facing, then your namaz will still be accepted. However, if you are in the Baytullah itself, meaning that in the actual haram itself, where you can see the Baytullah, then in that situation you have to be facing bang on directly towards the house of Allah. Because when you are in the haram, you know, there's no difficulty in it. You could easily like position and move yourself accordingly to get the exact position to pray Salah. But obviously when we are outside the city of Makkah, when you are in England, in America, Canada and so on, it's very difficult to get it bang on pinpoint towards the, the Aine Qibla. So therefore, the scholars have said that there is a, a 45 degree leeway. And even from the Ayat al itself, Allah didn't use the word Aine Qibla, He used the word Shatra. And Shatra means towards, meaning in Arabic that it doesn't have to be bang on, but as long as it is more or less towards that direction, your namaz will still be accepted, your namaz will be valid. And then the next part of the verse, Allah says, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ لَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ that Allah is then saying that even the people of the book, Utul Kitab, they know that the turning of the Qibla is actually a truth, the truth, the haq, mirabbihim from their Lord. 
Now, why has Allah mentioned this right at the end? Is basically many of the people who did the Ishqal, that why has the Qibla changed from uh, Masjid Aqsa to the Baytullah? It was done by the Jews. And I mentioned the reason why they wanted, like, obviously, cause a bit of stir and obviously put some doubt in the minds and in the iman of the people who had just recently converted. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right at the end, is saying that to tell the truth, even the Jews, they know. They know that the changing of the Qibla from Masjid Aqsa to the Baytullah, that in itself is the truth and it's an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how do they know? It's mentioned in the Torah. It's mentioned, one of the, you know, when, when, remember in the Torah, it's mentioned all the attributes are mentioned of Absalom of the final religion. And one of the attributes, one of the things which are mentioned in their scriptures is that the Muslims, they will be firstly facing towards Masjid Al-Aqsa and thereafter towards the Qibla would change towards Baytullah. It's mentioned. It's mentioned in the scriptures. Now that's why Allah is saying that the people of the book, they know that the Muslims are going to change their Qibla from Masjid Al-Aqsa to the Baytullah. They know this. But obviously to cause a stir, to cause ikhtilaf amongst the people, they kind of raise this objection. But in their books, in their scriptures, it's mentioned that the Qiblas of the Muslim would be changed from Masjid Al-Aqsa to the Baytullah. So Allah is saying that the Jews and the Christians, they really know this. They truly know this, but obviously to cause ikhtilaf, to cause kind of panic, to put some doubt in the hearts of the believers, they raise this objection and they raise this etiraz. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, uh, there's no mention of this in the Torah nowadays or there's no mention of it in the Bible or any of the scriptures. The answer is simple. It's nowadays. I.e. It, it was mentioned before in the books. But what they did was that they deleted everything. That's why even if you were to open the Torah now, there'll be no mention of Rasulullah's attributes. There'll be no mention of the final prophet coming to the city of Yathrib by Medina Munawwara. Why? Because they deleted it. They're taking it out. So now if you were to open the Torah and Injil, you won't find anything mentioned about Prophet Wasallam about the changing of the Qibla. Because what they've done is that they've taken all of it out. But obviously if you were to look at the Asal, you know, the Asal book and so on, which was given to Musa alayhi salam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all these things would have been there. But obviously the people later on, because of the hasad they had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Islam, they took everything away. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them of the action and saying that Wamallahu bihafilin amma ya'malun that Allah is not unaware of what you guys are doing. Meaning that Allah is always bahabar in what you are doing. Allah is aware. Even though you're doing all these kind of deceptions and you've deleted and you've taken these things out. Don't think that oh, Allah just like oh, you know, doesn't know about it because obviously our aqidah, our belief is that Allah knows everything. Whatever we do in front of people, whatever we're doing discreetly, whatever we're doing when we are locked in a room, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware. So similarly, Allah is aware of what they have done and obviously the main punishment will be meted out in the hereafter. May Allah give us the tawfiq to what has been said.